The Bronwyn, the trend we're looking at that this week is flying cars. Now, when I initially looked at the document you had sent me, I thought you were talking about self-driving cars, but no, flying cars. Take me through the reality here. Yeah, well, flying cars are quite an interesting one because when people thought about the future, I mean, over the last sort of 100 years or so, what was the one thing that was always definitive of what the future is going to be like? I mean, we had all those images coming out from the Jetsons of flying cars and everyone gets to hop into their own little UFO and fly around like that. It's the ultimate symbol of freedom and of the sort of aspirational future that we were all sort of hoping for. And in fact, we kind of hope we'd be there by now. But flying cars have proven a little bit trickier to actualize into reality than perhaps futurists and technologists would have liked. But drones are certainly forging ahead in this arena. So we must be quite close. I mean, I believe you, you can get a almost like a taxi environment with a drone to get from A to B in the current environment. Yes, and that's exactly what we're seeing, that finally, now in the year sort of 2021, perhaps a few years later than we would have liked, flying cars seem to be something that is back on the table, something that's been taken seriously, not just by industry and by technophiles, but actually by governments too. And these are sort of signposts and signals that we look for in the trend and future space to see that something is actually really happening here, because that's what tends to happen with, with future technologies and, and adoption of things that happens slowly and then suddenly. What we've started to see is that they're quite a few governments that are now actually putting in plans place for flying cars. So governments and regulators have obviously had to grapple with this because we obviously don't want people flying around in the skies crashing into each other. We know road traffic is problematic enough as it is. But if regulators are able to open their minds to the possibilities here, it can do quite a lot from an environmental perspective, from an economic perspective, from efficiency perspective, because obviously if we can get people off the roads, we can rewild a lot of that natural space that has been taken up by cars that affects how our cities are made and segregates it really in reality and could hopefully make life more efficient. But it does come with a lot of disclaimers in that yeah, course, and I was going to stop. I mean, first of all, there are the environmental concerns that we need mm. to drill down into. Um, is this being taken into account? Obviously, the fuel that will be utilized is essential to long-term viability when we're looking to a sustainable planet. Yes, and that's that's exactly why these sort of ideas are now sort of all culminating into a place that they could be taken to the next sort of step towards actualizing into our reality in terms of flying cars. Because if we're going to get things like flying cars, all they are essentially is sort of a, a drone but, or a helicopter that is uh, something that's able to move people from point A to point B. Now, it doesn't make sense to start setting up sort of personalized aerial transportation routes if we're not taking advantage of new technologies. That's where it gets quite interesting. It's the culmination of autonomous technology that would be drone technology like you were speaking about previously and then your more green eco-efficient fuel technologies at the same time so when it comes to innovation what we often like to see with industry and with nations that are able to adopt new technologies where there is nothing yet built it is a lot easier to apply something new than it is to sort of retrofit new technologies new ideas onto existing systems and structures i.e legacy so, infrastructure is sometimes a key debilitator Yes, exactly. So when it comes to sort of retrofitting every car on the road from petrol or diesel engines into sort of more electric vehicles, that's a monumental task. If you're starting with essentially a clean slate and say, okay, we're going to be implementing entirely new traffic infrastructure in the skies, what are we going to use? Are we going to adopt old technologies? Or are we going to start with adopting new technologies? So if you're able to start thinking about aerial transportation networks and sort of people moving drones, is so the way we're sort of calling these sorts of things at the moment, they will likely use autonomous technology, green energy technology, and entirely new ways of manufacturing these vehicles all at the same time. Then of course, so another thing that needs to take into consideration, and that is remote working, and the overall impact that that is going to have on the need for transportation. To give you an idea, I've worked across over the last seven days, across 30 countries in Africa, from the comfort of my studio here at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Yeah, that's absolutely that's absolutely part of the point. Yes, we are shifting how we work and where we work into more remote remote locations, but at the same time, there's a sort of opportunity in that space too. So people are literally moving and living in more dispersed environments 
personal transportation or one-on-one -on -one transportation becomes that much more important. So if we are seeing mass migration of the sort of affluent class into more rural areas and into smaller towns, perhaps the ground terrestrial transportation networks aren't quite going to keep up with that. And it's a good opportunity to start looking at new ways to get around. So as you were saying, you've been broadcasting to many different places across the continent, but I also know people who still commute from one province in South Africa to another to get the benefit of the lifestyle and the networking effects of the city. So with all of these trends, there's a lot of sort of complexity that goes on in and around it. I think the things to be realistic about when it comes to things like aerial transportation networks is they are likely to continue being only for the rich, the really, really elite classes in our societies. That's where the sort of Jetsons imagery of every family having their own personal flying car. It's not quite the same thing that happened with terrestrial cars where most middle class families can aspire to at least having that sort of vehicle. Because at the same time that we're looking at all those new technologies of things like automation and green technology, we also have other sort of systems level technologies that can come into play, particularly on the sort of on-demand networks. So basically like your e-hailing type services to have these transportation pods that can be available on demand, so people don't necessarily have to own them. It's also easier so how to regulate. Far are we as we close out, how far off are we of having a widespread take up of transportation pods as you refer to them? Not that close where we are in South Africa, but there are pockets of these sort of smart cities that are adopting these technologies. So you can look at what's happening in the more affluent parts of the Middle East, like your Dubai type regions, and also parts of Southeast Asia that are developing quite quickly. India has incidentally been quite proactive in actually developing the regulatory framework that is necessary to get these things literally moving through the skies. So as always, we can be excited, but with a pinch of salt saying it's not going to be available necessarily for everyone, much like helicopters have been around for quite a long time. They're not for everyday usage for people like you and I necessarily. Bronwyn, thank you so much. We'll catch up again next week, uh, looking to the future. And that is Bronwyn Williams, partner at Flux Trends, joining us here on our weekly Future Focus. Thank you.